Hello and welcome. My name is Carol Carter and I'm the founder and CEO of Global Minded. We are dedicated to creating a capable, diverse talent pipeline to get more women, people of color, every way you can define diversity into the education, economic mobility and leadership pipeline. We do this by working with first generation to college students, minoritized students, poverty affected students, and we connect them to role models, mentors, internships, experiences, and jobs. And we are delighted that we have a network of really incredible people. Um, we call ourselves the Inclusive Success Network. And every month we have different sessions. Many of you have joined us before for these STEM sessions. And this whole month, all of our different sessions are honoring um, our leaders for Black history. So we have um, this session today, we've had two others this week, and we have one on the 28th with our health equity leaders, and it's at the same time of the day. So we'll hope that you'll join us for that. And then I'll also ask you to mark your calendars, June 22, 23, 24, when we have our live global-minded event, which we haven't seen each other live in a couple of years, and we're looking forward to seeing all of you for that. So uh, now I'm thrilled to introduce our uh, leader in the STEM equity work that we do here at Global Minded, and that's Paula Garcia Todd and her incredible panel today. So welcome Paula and panelists. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having us as always, Carol. Thanks for creating the space that allows us to have these important conversations. Um, today, I'm really excited about the panelists. We've pulled together uh, different backgrounds and I love that we even have a student voice in our panel today, so important. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna let everyone introduce themselves and then we'll get into the questions. So I will start with Dr. Hall. Hi, yeah, I'm Dr. Janie Hall. Um, not too sure what else you want to know. Uh, adjunct for Texas Southern University, PhD from Jackson State University, doing a postdoc position now with Morgan State University. So I am HBCU proud. <laughs> that is awesome. Thank you so much and welcome. All right, next I will go to Soso. Hi, everybody. My name is Soso Wayne. I am a senior studying computer science at the Pennsylvania State University, University Park. I'm originally from Houston, Texas, and um, yeah, I'm just really excited to be here. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, it just hit me because I usually reach out within my network of, of friends to, to join. Uh, we've got a, a lot of Penn Staters here. <laughs> So we got so so myself and then my good friend Quasi is also on. So I'll let Quasi introduce himself next. Thanks, Paula. Yes, my name is Quasi Vincent. Uh, graduated, like Paula said, from Penn State with my degree in electrical engineering. Um, spent several years in industry, telecommunications, uh, supply chain, and logistics, a variety of fields. Uh, before finally landing where I'm at now, which is uh, uh, in education. I'm a math teacher here in Philadelphia, uh, specifically I teach at a project-based school in West Philadelphia called the Workshop School. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and then last but not least, Jason, who's a good friend of mine here in Atlanta. Hello, everybody. My name's Jason. I didn't go to Penn State. No, I'm just joking. I, I, uh, <laughs> I went to the University of Michigan. I'm a husband, uh, a father of uh, two little girls. I uh, have an engineering degree, went to uh, chemical engineering, um, uh, took this educator route, though. So did engineering for a little while, realized it was not for me. But I love engineering, and I want to get kids involved in it. And so that was the great spin for me. So became a, a educator, taught middle school for a long time, and then shifted into STEM consulting and now do consulting with Grand Moore Educational Design Consultants. Awesome. Thank you all for being here today. All right. So uh, let's get started. Um, I guess I'd like to kind of start with just understanding the the foundation of where we sit today right so we're all aware of the need to bring more underrepresented students into stem fields i'm an engineer myself 
I'm very aware that only about 2% of engineers are Latinas like myself. I hardly see people that look like me in meetings um, across this country. But I'm curious if anyone here has any interesting statistics that you want to share uh, to help us better understand the current state of Black students and professionals in STEM fields. So I can start with um, maybe so just women in general, as far as us getting our STEM education. So the NSF reported that we get higher education degrees more than men, but when it, then men are disproportionately outnumber us when it comes to actually STEM. And then when we actually do enter our higher education, another stat is we're, we're changing our uh, major, first year in, we're changing our major to a non-STEM type of um, a major. And I'm not too sure what the, what the change is. And I guess we'll probably cover some of that stuff because I know my story will we'll touch on that some, but then also for employment wise, the uh, National Science Foundation, they also reported that like 52% of women are in the college educated workforce. But 29% of that were represented in the actual engineering workforce. And then when you actually get to Black women in the educated workforce for engineering, it's down to like 2%. So yeah, we're very underrepresented. Yeah. I'd say if I, I add to that, in, and I thank you for giving us the opportunity, Paula, when you said 2%, of the you know of the population or Latino, um, I looked up you know the numbers and uh, especially when you look at the regions and so like let's just say Silicon Valley for example like you know you you know good luck finding two percent you know black or Latino in that situation. However, you know it's Black History Month and I'm all like all right there's got to be some good news here. So I'm in Atlanta and so Atlanta is turning into a bit of a tech mecca. And so where, you know, if I go out to out West and there's 2% of the population are black, uh, in Chicago, it's 8%, okay, which is major. Uh, if you go to DC, it's 17, per, uh, it's 17%. And then in Atlanta, it's 25 and sometimes 26%. And which is nuts to think about because you're like, you know, one out of every four, tech person is a, is a black or brown person like that's that's amazing that's new news i got that out of the atlanta uh, journal constitution um but uh 25 percent you know again that's from a black tech infrastructure and, and then some big tech schools that are running you know major league stem pipelines and so that i just wanted to to offset what i thought i was looking for i was like let me find some low numbers and i found some really high numbers which i was very encouraged by that is very very promising thank you so much for sharing that um, okay, so so now that we kind of have a little bit of foundation, let's get into the hard questions, right? So what are some of the hardships for Black students interested in pursuing STEM? And I know some might be complex, but as you talk through what some students may experience, that, you know, I'd also welcome ideas of how we can overcome some of those challenges. Uh, I can go. Uh, sure. So for just for me, for my own personal journey and adjuncting, uh, and I've taught some classes at Jackson State as well. I noticed that one of the main concerns is the math that's required for engineering students. It's one of the obstacles. I think it's one of those things that deter students from even engaging in engineering because, as I think back and listen to some of the stories too. When you're in high school, you talk to your counselors, you talk to advisors, whoever at that point is kind of um, encouraging you or advising you. As soon as you say engineering, they tell you there's gonna be a lot of math. There's gonna be a lot of math. And so I would like to see some of that math, engineering math, some, some type of engineering concepts associated with the math introduced early on K through 12 or even earlier if possible, just some simplistic elements of it. Doesn't have to be full, full press, right? But just so their first time seeing it wouldn't be at college. 
that puts them way behind the curve and it's very frustrating and it's very intimidating. The first time you see something, you have a semester to get it down and get a grade. That's, that's very, yeah. I, I would like to see us do something about that. And I noticed that, I know at um, Texas Southern and Jackson State that they've implemented an engineering analysis course, but I've sat in on some of those courses and they seem to be just, just another calculus course, just another math course. They're not really associating any of the engineering concepts that relate to those type of, um, that type of math. For instance, if you're using integrals to solve some type of equation or something like that, it's just another math course. But if you tell me, oh, I have an RL series circuit that I need to apply to this, then, it's, it's, then you're implementing engineering too. And that may pique the interest, may try to uh, deduce some of the barriers that people have when math concepts come into play. Because if you tell me, I'm just going to sit here and do math, I'm like, no, thank you. But if you say, we're going to also see some circuitry side of it, then I'm like, okay, let me see what I can do. So yeah, I, I just like to see the math be addressed a little earlier. Yeah, that's a great point. And I know, Kwesi, now you are a math teacher. That is your focus. I'm curious if you have any additional thoughts on that topic and any other thoughts that you have on, you know, some of the challenges for Black students that want to engage in STEM? Yeah, I think the, the academic preparation piece is definitely, you know, one of the biggest challenges that I've encountered in terms of whether it's my own personal experience or um, working with other uh, young, <clears throat> young Black men and women who are, who either say they you know, the don't not sure what they want to do and may be intimidated by pursuing engineering or those who want to and are just don't have the, the strong preparation needed to complete the degree within a reasonable time frame. So absolutely everything that the, the prior panelists said is true. I mean, I think there is uh, a lack of teaching math in a way that is uh, that shows its applications in practical ways. And um, it starts very, very early on. Um, and it, it's it's one of the and then uh, and not only math let me throw it even though i'm a math teacher but let me throw in science as well i mean there these are things that if you are not on track to do um what would be the equivalent of like an ap calculus or an ap chemistry ap physics by the time you are uh, a senior in high school um the chances of you finishing the baccalaureate degree in engineering or or any of the other stem fields is not very high right like the you know you you have to have a certain level of <clears throat> academic um conditioning right before going into the, the the stem undergraduate process and um if you if you come from the space of not having having been conditioned um, to do that work and to think in those ways um, uh, necessary to be successful in those subjects, then uh, your, like I said, your, your chances of being successful at the bachelorette level are going to be decreased. And so, um, so yeah, so in, in terms of solutions, it, I mean, it has to be so multifaceted. Uh, there's so many things that, that need to be done from early intervention to, you know, just kind of even reshaping the way, um, education is kind of done um, once you get uh, at all levels, but especially once you get to the high school level. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And it starts so early, right? Because for you to even get to those AP classes at a high school level, you have to be at a certain path in middle school even, right? And so we tend to forget how early that pipeline really, really starts with those classes. So, so did you have anything that you wanted to add on, on this topic as well? Yes, I actually did. I would say the majority of the people that I know in engineering right now, like pursuing that career, didn't come from like a math heavy or a science heavy, heavy background. A lot of people would just apply to school and they're like, engineering sounds cool. And I think that's something that um, is a really great bar barrier for a lot of people is that when you go to all these classes, you don't really have a community. You don't know anybody taking these classes. You feel like really isolated and really alone. It's hard to establish those connections to like, create a study group or create friends that hold you accountable, all of that. So I think um, it can be really like discouraging because you go to your advisor, they're like, oh, math's not your best subject. Maybe you should consider this, this or that. And like all through my college experience, it's happened to everybody that I know that like 
people are discouraged as you get higher up to like pursue something that's like easier or just not engineering. And I think if I weren't as involved as I am with uh, the National Society of Black Engineers, I I wouldn't still be here. I would. It's very easy to like look around in classes and everyone's friends. Everyone has their own communities, and like you're like, what is going on? So I I definitely think like establishing those um, communities earlier on in college or even in high school um, could really pay play a huge difference. Yeah. Absolutely. And then that carries through too, right? Even when you're in the workforce, I always tell folks, you have to find your own board of directors as well, like your personal board of directors, like find your community, right? That that carries through. Sorry, Jason, what were you going to say? No, no, I was just going to say Miss Wayne is like dead on, like super, super accurate. Um, and I'm going to talk middle schoolish because because that's where you, know, you can be like dope at math in like fourth grade and have lost all the love by eighth grade, like just all of it. Like you could be a straight A student, you you love math. And so if I were to just go back to what Ms. Wayne is talking about, like even just the, like your question, Paula, was like the hardships, like the hardships I see is like, you get to engineering, but you really didn't get a full blown exposure of what engineering was. Like, you know, like that's the big hardship for black students is like, are you even exposed to what does it mean to be an engineer? I, I picked engineering, I, I swear, I picked engineering because it, I looked at the list that said the highest paid bachelor degree and chemical engineer was it for like six years running. And I was like, I'm clearly gonna be a chemical engineer. And nobody stopped me. No one said, hey, look, you, you know, have you done any of that know, know yourself stuff? Like, have you, have you ran a personality test on you to see if you got a lot of artist in you or do you got a lot of techie engineering in you? And so, and I, I think that that's where, at least for me, and I'm, I'm talking about me and my students, I'm really actively going like, you know, I want you to go into STEM fields. And, and, and the reasons are, I, you know, we could rack off a bunch of reasons for them. But I don't want you to, I don't want you to know what you're going into. And so I think that that is solved by exposure. And so, you know, organizations that expose and do stuff like that, I think we'll talk about a little bit later, but that's probably my biggest job as a as a STEM educator is exposing you to this, exposing you to this, because you cannot see it. Like if you can't see it, you have no idea. And if you don't know, then when you get into those weed out classes and they are weed outs for a reason, that math class is supposed to wear you out. Like that PCHEM class is supposed to, you should feel like what is going on? Everybody else is too, but it's designed for that. But if you didn't get exposed to, oh, I really have a love for nuclear energy, then when it gets bad and you don't have a network with Miss Wayne is talking about, you're you're out there. Like it, it did it, it's gonna do exactly what it's supposed to do. I have I have students right now that have switched from engineering degrees to to you know, they're film majors. Shout out to the film majors, by the way. No, no disrespect, but I'm like, they shifted and, but they didn't know exactly what they were doing when they first walked in. So I think that that's a huge hardship is exposure for black students to this STEM fields for real, for real. Yeah. And so that's a great lead way into how, how do you really solve that? How do you create more exposure, right? Like what, what are ways that we can do that and we can do it at a younger age as well? Any thoughts on that from any of the panelists? I give you a fast one and I'll stop talking so much. Yeah. If you're an educator and you are trying to expose students, any students, they don't have to be black students, any students to engineering or STEM fields, and you are in a box like your four walls and you are the, you're the smartest person in the room, like, and I'm an educator, like I'm a te I'm talking to myself as well. Jason Rains, you are messing up. If I don't get some people in to talk the talk and show them what's going on. So one of the best ways for educators, I would say, is to find programs that allow you to bring in STEM educators. And, and then in addition to that, if you can find programs that your kids can go to places because it's, you know, I know it's COVID and everybody, nobody's doing visits and stuff like they used to, but um, I can't tell you how many kids have changed their mind on stuff, good way and bad way, because they got to go look at it. So I think that that's one of the best ways is, you know, you know, partnerships, find a STEM mentor that can come into your classroom and then find some STEM mentors, some STEM pros that you can go into their world. Like that's the, that's a huge piece right there. Agreed. I'm a huge proponent of those collaborations and partnerships between STEM professionals and schools. I, I think they're very impactful. 
Any other thoughts? I think there, I mean, there is to the, to the degree to which um, these things are, you know, not mutually exclusive, but I, I think where education in the, in the formal sense and the, what you guys are talking about, the exposure kind of meet, if we had, if we had ways of integrating, you know, wh whether it's materials in the way of, of books, videos, anything like that, that merge the gap between those two things is, is really, you know, I guess how I would summarize it is like the, we have standard curriculums and, and things like that for math, science, and so on and so forth. And they're, they're, they're kind of their core concepts, core principles that these, um, that these curriculums are used to sort of bring out in students. Um, when, I, when I think about the, the eight practices for math education, things like that. So these are all things that are applicable, right, to engineering, science, to a variety of STEM fields. Um, so if there is a way to um, illustrate to students more often or young people more often, how these things are applied, how these tr different transferable skill sets, how things like repeated reasoning and logic and all that kind of stuff are applied in practical ways and, and interesting ways that affect the world around them. Um, I think that, you know, the things like that will generate more interest. Um, and then for a lot of students who also don't, don't really um, understand that there's also a lot of the, the entrepreneurial uh, aspects to to the STEM fields as well. I think um, there's obviously a big, there seems to be a, a strong desire for students to kind of carve their own way and um, whether it be financial success or whatever. And I don't think many of them associate STEM with that and um, the, to the degree to which we can educate them better on that um, would help as well. Yeah, those are excellent points. And I loved how even when you were talking about like the principles within the math education and so forth, you weren't talking about how hard the subject is. You're talking about the characteristics of the students to be able to succeed, right? And I, I don't think we spend enough time talking about that too, right? Because sometimes students say, well, I'm, I'm not good at math, but you're very curious and you're very creative. And that can also lead you to a very successful STEM career as well, right? So we, we don't emphasize the other people skills, soft skills that can also make you very successful in STEM too. We tend to focus on the hard and the math, right? I don't know. So, so did you have any thoughts on, on that in particular as well? Yes. So I'm going to start off with saying I'm terrible at math. Uh, it's been my worst subject my entire life and I don't understand why. It is just very confusing for me. Um, but like here I am my senior year as a comp sci major. So I think something, thank you. <laughs> I think something that wasn't really expressed to me is that just because you're not good at something doesn't mean that you can't do it eventually or like find a way to push through. Um, math is pretty much like half of my major. Like I'm always doing it. I like see numbers in my head when I dream, but I think really being passionate about coding and like all the like applications that computer science can be, um, apply to in the real world, like all my dreams, my passions can make me good at math. Like, I'm just like so passionate about it that I'm like, okay, I really got to like learn how to do this one way or the other, because if I want to get to where I want to get to, I have to just figure this out. And it's not easy. And there are so many resources out there, especially like at a collegiate level um, for like free tutoring, study groups, all those sorts of things that like, just because you're not good at something doesn't mean that you can't push through and like get to your goal in the end. Um, about exposing people a little bit earlier to the STEM fields. I think something that I didn't get to experience, but I know a lot of people who did and like are here now. Um, just extracurriculars such as like Girls Who Code or like a robotics club, just because it's not like specific to what you wanna do in the future. It does like open a whole new world of like, wait, like this is really interesting to me. Maybe I can do this in the future or like just different career paths that like a lot of people didn't know about. Um, I was like interested in electrical engineering because I like sat in on my friend's robotics club meeting one time and I was like this is so cool but unfortunately it was like my senior year so I, I never really got to like get super involved but just like little exposure can really make a whole difference in the student's life. Agreed, agreed. Thank you for that. So 
we're talking about, I love how you brought up, you know, Girls Who Code and all these different programs. I'm curious if anyone has any thoughts about what programs they've seen be really effective in attracting and retaining Black students into STEM. And if you've kind of considered what are some of the elements about those programs that make them really successful? Dr. Hall, did you have any thoughts on that? I haven't, I have yet to see, and I've been through to uh, a few schools and I will name all of them because at this point, like I've been, um, I worked as industry electrical engineer, did that, um, I was an art engineer for a while. So I've been around for a while, right? So I'm expecting to see some growth and some things. And now that I'm on the academia side, I'm still not, no, I, I haven't. I'm, I can't wait to hear what the other panelists have to say because I haven't seen anything that's concrete and attracting, retaining, it, no, no, I haven't. I, I'm sorry, I can't speak to that one. Anyone else want to weigh in? Can I weigh in real fast? Yes. Okay, so I'm, I'm Georgia heavy because I'm in Georgia, but like Georgia Tech has programs and I'll, I'll do this. I won't even just stay in Georgia. I, I'm from Michigan too. So, but like the College of Engineering's oftentimes have, you know, diversity and inclusion programs. Okay. And so I'm not going to just make it a Georgia Tech thing. And there might be one at Penn State University of Michigan had one. Ours is called the Minority Engineering Program Office back in the 90s. The one that's in College of Engineering is called Diversity and Inclusivity. They are like, I, I learned this like two a year ago that like Georgia Tech pushes out the most, you know, black male and female engineers in the nation, which I thought was like, and I have to double check this, but I thought it was like Prairie Viewer. I thought it was a HBCU in Texas to say the truth, but it's tech. And Georgia Tech is just pushing these students through, um, like programs that are longitudinal, like they're bringing you in in seventh and eighth grade on campus for a week or two, you know what I mean? And so like, I'll, I'll pick another one, I'll drop these in the chat, um, Detroit area, and now I'll, I'll answer it and then I'll say some of the components, but the DAPSEP is what it's called, Detroit area pre-college engineering program. In eighth grade, you know, my mom or somebody who thought I was decent enough in math signed me up for it. And what I did was I visited University of Michigan multiple summers in a row. And each summer I got a little bit longer, like a three week visit or like a, a four week visit. You know, my going into my senior year, I stayed up there for four weeks, which means like I've been rubbing shoulders with college students and eating in cafeterias and I know how to sleep in a dorm. Like it, I already, it built me to the point where I can do this, even though there's all kinds of reasons why I couldn't do there. So those programs that understand, you gotta have a little bit of funding to do that. And so I would give you those two, the College of Engineering and then DAPSEP. And then as far as like, you know, programs that aren't as, you know, you don't, you don't run into a pipeline like that. I just got to shout out Science ATL because Science ATL definitely puts a lot of time and energy in putting together pipeline work that gets, you know, black and brown students involved in science, technology, engineering, and math. You know, it's called Science ATL, but it's a STEM organization in my world. And if you look at how they're setting it up, you can sign up when you, you can be in a program when you're in seventh grade and you can write that program all the way till you're a senior, like the same program with the same leaders who like believe in you. And so I think that's the biggest component is like, you know, not the one offs because it's really hard to do a one off and then I, and somebody else can do a one off. But those programs that try to put the hooks on you and then they say, hey, look, I see potential in you. And Miss Wayne, I need you to be with me for like six years and then bug them with emails and calls. Those programs work, man. Totally agree. And for people outside of Georgia, what Science ATL does here is they create that STEM ecosystem that exists in many other cities as well. And, and those that's where you can find that programming that will come into school and they tend to be very also based on, on equity and, and trying to bring more underrepresented students into STEM. So you will find a lot of programming like that um, within STEM ecosystems. And I, Quiz, I'm sorry, I think you guys say, are, are we tracking these students? So we're, we're exposing them at these younger ages. Are we tracking them into the college? Are we tracking them into the workforce? Are we knowing that they're staying, they're actually going through the pipeline or are they falling off? Do we know what's happening? I can talk about the programs that I was in. So I was within DAPSTEP and in, in the University of Michigan's Minority Engineering Program Office, and I was fully tracked. Now, you know, 
tracking your grades within schools dicey sometimes because you may not have the permission to get the grades from the students. But if you are in a program that you're, you know, I think we we're going to eventually have like a, we need to have a parent conversation at some point because they're, they're the key as well. But if your parents believe in what you're trying to do, you can get that access as well. And so the most tracking they can do is to where you picked school. And they have skin in the game because they probably want you to go to tech or go to, you know, Penn State. And so now when you get there, then now the program office has more skin in the game because you're going to throw their numbers off if you don't matriculate. You know what I mean? They want to, you know, and it's changed. I, you know, my engineering degree is is not new. So I've, I've seen it shift over time, but I, I think it's getting better. I think that there's, some, you know, there's some change in there where it's like, these the program offices that I'm talking about. They really do want to get these kids pushed through the program. So I would say yes, tracking after you get in the middle or after you get out of high school, it's a little bit easier. But in high school and middle school, you can track as strong as your parents allow you to track. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I agree. I, t I tend to talk to when students are trying to figure out what schools they're interested in. I always tell them to look for that diversity office and it may have different names uh, at Penn State is the inclusion and outreach program, like whatever the name is, um, look for that because that's going to create that community. Right. So really, really important. Thanks for adding that. Uh, Kwesi, did you have anything to add on that in terms of effective programs to attract and retain uh, students into STEM? There's not one in particular that I uh, that I would advocate for. I mean, I think um, the you know the corporate community. I'm sure your your company does a lot of great things, and you know the, the colleges. They everybody's doing something, right? Like, and, and I and I think it's great. I think it's all helpful. I don't think there's one magic bullet. Um, I think er, everyone who's involved in this work is is you know it, it has the best intentions and is trying to find something that works. Um, I think as always, you know, it, it, uh, the, it was the gentleman who's retiring this year. I mean, you know, it, it, if we found out what, you know, what he's doing at his campus, uh, Freeman uh, Herbowski um, at U University of Maryland, Baltimore County, right? Like it, he's had tremendous success there. And so, you know, what's he doing um, and, and seeing uh, how that can be you know, replicated in different phases. So um, there's not one in particular thing that I'd advocate for because I see, I, I think they all have uh, have merit in, in some way, shape or form, so. Awesome, thank you for that. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to, Jason, you made a comment about parents and um, I think I'm gonna start with the student perspective with, with SOSA on this one, but what do you think the role of family is in, helping and 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 potentially doing more to increase the number of underrepresented students that become more interested in STEM? I think family plays a huge role. I think the reason why I'm this far into being an engineer is because my father comes from an engineering background. So a lot of the opportunities I like heard of or I'm interested in in and involved in it is because my dad. Uh, I only heard about Nesby because my father like knew about Nesby. He knew about SPE. He knew about all these different organizations. And something he stressed um, and like really ingrained in me like throughout my childhood was when you get to college because you're going to be an engineer, you need to get involved. So um, and just like expose yourself early. So like I started coding like a little bit early because like everyone gets that jump start. I definitely think you need to have like a good family or a good support system. Um, when you're getting into engineering, because engineering is hard. It takes a huge mental toll on you. It's it's expensive for all these books, labs, and all these different resources. And without having like a good support system behind you, it, it's kind of impossible to do. I wouldn't be here without my friends, my communities, and my, my parents, definitely not. Um, and just like other people in general, like within your community, it's important to pass along like different scholarship opportunities or like programs. I think that's something that people often forget to do, like passing along the baton of um, different opportunities that you've had that like someone else might not have heard of. It's so important to like basically put somebody else on to something that you experience and something that helps you a lot because you never know what they can learn from it and they can pass on to the next person, the next person. So I think just like family is important, but just the support system in general is like the most important thing that I've learned throughout this experience. 
Yeah. And I love that you brought up that passing it on is so, so important, right? We all learn from each other. That's great. Um, anyone else in terms of the role of family or even educators in helping to increase the number of, of Black students going into STEM? Can I, can I not give a solution, but give a point? Um, because if I had the solution, then um, I would rush off of this and write a book, and then you would not see me for a while after I cash these checks. No, I just messing. So this is what I'm saying. The, the, it's changed. It, it was already like, there's whole coalitions of like parental involvement. Like I could probably drop, like, I think it's like National Coalition of Parental Involvement or something like that. And so I'll give my viewpoint for what it looks like in school because like, you know, parental involvement was already challenging. If you were, if you, you know, I can go off of my school. I, I went to, I taught students in a little school offside of, you know, Atlanta, it's called Stone Mountain. And so Stone Mountain, you know, we were trying our best to be a little STEM school. You know what I mean? We were gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna build this little robot and we're gonna go do some fun stuff and have a competition, right? We had to get our parents involved. We had a thousand kids, I think, at, at that school, about a thousand kids at that school. And so a PTA night, you know, we're like, all right, we got to, here's our moment to get these parents involved. It's like 12, maybe, you know, 14 parents, okay? I mean, families, like, you know, we tried, we would offer dinners, we would do buses, we do all kinds of things like that. That's this, and I, and I say that as a, as a point, but not a solution, pre-COVID. And so like COVID, like you can't even get in, in the school. Like, I don't know if any of you have stute children, but like, depending on where your kids go to school, that's even another barrier. So I only bring it up to say that like, as much as Miss Wayne says, and we got the same situation. My, my mom and dad totally got the game rolling for me. Um, but if I put that they couldn't come to my school and if I, if I added like, you know, even more challenges because of the, you know, don't even get me going in like just the social and emotional learning situation that we have going on right now. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a big challenge that has to be addressed. And so, and I would say the only thing that I've done that worked really well in, in, in my world is just massive persistence. Like, like we just, we just persisted and, and anything we could do that we found as a, as a W, like parents like wins, you know what I mean? And you know, if we if we found anything, I don't care if it was like anything that we could f figure out was a W to bring parents in, it worked and it just snowballed and snowballed and snowballed. And that same school that, you know, we weren't even coming to our meetings, you know, were bringing us water and all kinds of, like it, it really shifted in about in a very short period of time, you know what I mean? So um, I don't know, I guess I'd give you that to say that like, you know, the ball has shifted. I feel a little bit backwards to tell you and, and parental involvement for all you know, not just black parents, but I think that the only way we can figure this thing out is to just like really just bear down and just persist. That's that's the best way I can call it. I don't think um, when I think about parent involvement, I just think someone to share that interest with. So mm -hmm. like someone mentioned coding for girls that it wasn't that a camp like just a matter say if you come home from school and you're parent has a camp that they're signing you up for based off your interests. That's involvement. That shows your interest. That shows that you're, you care about their, their student, their child's dreams, aspirations, whatever they're trying to do. So that in itself is encouraging, right? You don't, and me being a single mom, you can't ask me to put something else on my to-do list. But if just dropping my son off somewhere, is helping him, is encouraging him, motivating him to move forward. Yes, I was a you know cab driver for him as you know when he was younger, taking him everywhere. So definitely, um, there's different type of involvement for the parents, and that physical involvement can be a barrier. But if just showing, just showing any type of interest is important when you're talking about that family support. So just like the Miss um, um, So So, my dad introduced me to electrical. I mean, I was rewiring lamps when I was a young, young girl. So just to have that support, you know, when I got into my job, it was male dominant, 
but I could always call my dad and say, guess what they're saying? Guess what they're doing? So just to have that support was always a great thing for me. I never really worried about being the only female because I had his support, right? I had his male perspective to come home to. So he can tell me, oh, that's just male ego. Don't worry about it. Oh no, that may be something legitimate there. You may want to look at that, you know, so that family support, that community support is really important because when you look around, who do you have to reflect, to share anything with if you're the only one? And then that feeling of isolation that was brought up earlier, that can deter you from moving forward. So you definitely want to su surround yourself with something that looks like what you're trying to do. I think that's, I know it's important. I wouldn't have made it had it had I not had his, um, his support. Thank you for that. Um, I did just notice uh, a quick chat comment that came up about how some of these camps and opportunities cost money and some parents aren't able to financially support I'm curious if any of you have any ideas of resources for, you know, or, or scholarships or, or things that can help support students that may not be financially able to attend some of these types of events. Well, if I could start, I know for sure, and when you were asking about programs early, I guess what spending most of my time at HBCUs, there's no inclusive type programs because we are <laughs> we are the population, but they do offer for middle school, high schoolers, they do have summer programs for them in introducing them to these engineering concepts and they're free. This is at Texas Southern. I know they had it at Jackson State and they're free and they have them all year, every year. I think this has been continuing for, I want to say a decade for Texas Southern for sure. It's been around for a while. And I do believe they track those students. That was why I was interested in knowing about tracking um, earlier, but they track those students to see if they do actually enter. So yeah, some of the programs are free. And that's another thing for parent involvement. If you come home and say, got a camp for you to go to, mama can afford it, you can go, everything is great. So just imagine how encouraging that child would feel if that was presented to them. Thank you for that. Any other resources, scholarship programs, anything folks can tap into? Something I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Zozo. Oh, okay. Um, something that I learned a little bit too late in my college career was that usually when you go on to, this is specifically like going to a collegiate level, um, usually when you go on to like the College of Engineering or Science, whichever college, and um, that website of diversity and inclusion, there's like a list of these long scholarships. All you need to do is like submit like your transcripts, maybe like a personal statement or like why you think you're right fit. But this is something that people don't know about as much as they should, but they have thousands and thousands of amazing opportunities that people just like ignore because they don't feel like clicking onto the website. But it is like a really good resource and something that's definitely needs to be advertised a little bit more. But th that goes along with saying like, if you see it and you don't need it, pass along to somebody who does. Like if you're a parent and you see it and your child is like, wants to go into electrical, but this inter or this scholarship or this opportunity or program is for someone who wants to go into like mechanical pass along to someone they someone you know who's interested in that and like even forming like a community within with like amongst parents I think that's really important because like I have my mom sending me opportunities all the time from like other people's parents who know I'm interested in computer science and um I'm like thanks mom how'd you find out about this like I feel like she knows more about this than I do and she's not even in engineering so I think like you have to do your research. It's definitely hard, but they are there. You just have to like keep pushing on and ask questions. There are so many faculty members that have their own like piggy bank of scholarships and internships and programs for all of this for like students that really need it. And you just have to ask, you just have to put yourself out there and like, let them know your situation, let them know like you're passionate and they'll help you work through it. I want that process to be easier. Just speaking from my own personal background, and since I have my PhD, you can imagine how many 
levels of school I've gone through, my student loans, all of this, I want that to be easier for, especially for someone that had maintained, like in my um, PhD program, I maintained a 4.0 GPA. And that was still, it was still difficult for me to get scholarship money every semester. It's almost like it had to start over, even though I was eligible on all fronts, it's still a lot to have to write an essay to do this, to do that, and then there's a chance that you don't get it. So there's a lot of talent out there. There's a lot of students that are really smart maintaining these GPAs, and they're not getting any type of scholarships, even if they apply. And I know it can be competitive. I'm, I don't want that part to be easier. I just kind of want the processes within themselves to be a little easier for the students to apply. So maybe they can apply to however many they need to, Maybe this is a, a numbers game, more quantity, so they can maybe get something. So I apply to 10 and I get three. I'm covered, right? I, I just want it to be a little, a little easier. From my own personal experience, it was just like, <laughs> am I gonna get it this semester? I work my butt off of this money and I'm and I still have to go and apply for it. And I hated that. I just hated that. And I just feel bad for students that are behind me that it doesn't seem to have gotten any better. The process is for it anyway. And like um, so so said, there's a list out there. There's a whole list. But once you click, what are the other 500 steps that you have to take to even submit an application for it? It's, that's just, yeah, I want that to be <laughs> revamped. Can make a that. quick quick point ahead, real Jason. fast. Yeah. I could I have a, one of my students is at UGA and short on cash right now, and I was like, well, I guess you guys start writing, brother. You know, what I mean, like that. My mindset was like, I get you know, that's that's the play. And and Dr. Hall, it's a straight numbers game. It is. And what I think is cool, this is what I'm having him do. And like, if he's in a unique spot right now, I think anybody who's in education right now recognizes that like there is a flood of money that has shown up due to like pandemic and we'll just say black lives matter like literally big time companies are throwing cash now are they that's that disconnect again though paula like companies who have resources and students and or schools that need them is there a link that is there all the time not all the time not all the time but sometimes it's really as easy as like a, a, a very basic letter. And so this is what I told him to do and I, I'll leave it be. I mean, like basic, like, dear sir, you know, dear ma'am, I am at this school. Um, I very much like to, you know, participate in any type of collegiate program that you have, all right? It will land on somebody's desk and do something. It may do, it may just go into the trash, it may not, but, with email and with you writing a form letter or even a form essay that you're not gonna rewrite that thing over and over again. All I'm doing is changing the HR's name on that over and over and over again. It's gonna hit. And like, it was a play I did back in the nineties and we didn't have as much money coming through. It's the play we're about to run right now in 2022. Like, and I'll let y'all know whether or not, you know, we just started it, but that's our play. And I, I'm certain it's gonna work. That's an excellent point. There are resources out there. Yeah. How do you yeah. how do you reach them? Yeah. Right. Um, so as we're talking about scholarships, it can help but think about an organization like Nesby, right? And and everything that they offer. Um, and I think some students go into schools not even realizing that these organizations even exist. So I, I'd love to talk a little bit about professional organizations um, and their impact on students um, and even their impact on professionals in the workplace. So we'll start with the student piece. I'll start with SoSo. Um, you know, what your experience has been being in one of these professional engineering organizations. Um, and then I'll move it on. I know Kwesi was involved at Penn State as well on, on what that meant for him as a professional as well. So we are very recruitment heavy um, because it is a large campus. We have, I think like 46,000 students, like undergrad students. It's very large and it's very easy to like lose your space and lose your place and like I'm just one person this huge factory, if you will. So um, we are very recruitment heavy. We have two involvement fairs a year where um, it's like an open, um, pretty much like a fair. Everyone like walks around like you talk to people, but I would say that our general body members 
members or like all of our members recruit within our classes. Like if I see like a person of color in one of my classes in one of my engineering classes, I'm like, are you involved in anything? And they're like, no, I'm like, you should come to Nest meeting because it's so easy to not know about these things. We go to a big school, we're all college students, we're all busy. Those like flyers and the emails, it's very easy to like not pay attention to them. Um, so I kind of forgot the, the question, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Forgot what you thought. Just your experiences with Nesby and the impact it's had on you as a student. Oh yeah, um, I'll always say that Nesby is the one of the major reasons why I'm still in engineering. We have so much like academic help with tutoring. Like we have the Academic Excellence Center, so that's a bunch of like our students who did really well in certain classes, like chem or physics or engineering mechanics, whatever that is. So it's just like really helpful to have my friends pretty much break down concepts to me because in a lecture with 700 other people, I'm not gonna understand those concepts. But when it's like my friend explaining it in like very basic terms, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's what they were talking about. So I think like academically, it has really helped me push through and like reinforce the fact that I maybe I can do this and I'll like get somewhere. Professionally, I've gotten all my internships or yeah, all my internships and all my programs through Nesby. I did a program with Twitter, My the summer after my freshman year, just like a week long thing. And then I've interned with Microsoft twice as a software engineer. And that was solely because of my connections through Nesby. As soon as you go to career fair and you mentioned that you have a leadership position, they're like, oh, what do you do? And like, I love to talk about Nesby because it's it's really my family, it's my home in Penn State. And um, we do a lot. We also work with like um, pre-collegiate, we have a pre-collegiate collegiate initiative, which we work with high school students around the area. So we invite like the local high school students to come to our general body meetings. We have corporate sponsors come in to talk to, to us about like budgeting or like how to argue your salary or like um, like coding practices, like all sorts of things that like prepare you that the classroom will. So I think that's like something that people don't, realize that they need besides like the educational fact like factors you can be in a class all you want but you're not going to learn the real life skills that you really need to unless you put yourself out there and get involved absolutely those are great great Quasi, did you have anything to add on your experiences with nesby yeah i think the, the one thing that i'll add, just add is this idea of community which um Again, the previous panel the panelists touched on in her initial uh, comments. So the community, the, the community is a big part of success once you get to that college level. Um, so having Nez having that connection with other students who um, just have that common uh, interest and drive and desire and will um, help lift you up when you know when you're down and uh, or when you're struggling is important once you get there. So I, I definitely found Nesby to be incredibly valuable for that, um, for that, for that, for those purposes, uh, in my experience here. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. I, I will bounce back to you because I know as alumni, we've talked mm -hmm. a little bit about um, potentially mentoring students that are, you know, still coming through the university and so forth. I'd love to hear your thoughts about mentor mentorship and the importance of finding mentors when when you're an engineering student or a student in STEM. Yeah, I, I mean, I think one of the biggest things that that uh, that students lack when it comes to engineering. This was also mentioned earlier in the discussion. Is just a sense of where where can I go with this like when you know start when they start shaping their identity as it as it pertains to this major like what can I do what are the, some of the things that are possible um, just having somebody to bounce those ideas off of and, and someone who can um, speak with you uh, in, a, in a somewhat informed and um, and just experienced way about that kind of stuff is invaluable. And so I, I think the the mentor the mentorship piece, which is very important, it's just another extension of community. I would say, is like having someone who's been there, done that, and can, if not, give you like direct advice to do A, B, C, or D. At least, um, at, at least somebody there who can give you some feedback that is of relevance to, you know, the things that you're experiencing and the things that you're talking about. So I think that's a big, big important piece. Awesome. Thanks for that. 
Any other thoughts or comments on mentorship? I would actually like to um, say something. Um, the person I consider my biggest mentor at Penn State is Dr. Lauren Griggs. She is actually the person who recommended me for this panel. The most amazing influence in my life at this point. And I think something that adults like you all don't realize is how big of an impact your advice like makes. I am like a 21 year old. I don't know what these jobs are, but just being in the workforce at some point or having friends like around your age, it's so helpful to like talk to somebody one-on-one, -on -one. like, you know me, you know my skills, you know my weaknesses. What do you think like I'd be best at? Or do you know somebody who could tell me that? And I think um, my relationship with her has been super beneficial because I find I found out that software engineering is not what I want to do. I want to become a programmer, product manager, and I would never have like been able to figure that out if it weren't for her because she has friends who have um, been through computer science, been through the process, and she like I will never be able to like stop talking about how great this woman is and how great it is to have somebody who has your back, has your best interest in mind, but also has so much knowledge of like what academia is like, but also like what the workforce is like. Cause I was like, maybe I want to get my master's. And then she was like, why would you like, what do you want to get your master's in? And I was like, I don't know. And she was like, well, don't do it if you don't know. Like, it's so helpful for someone who's like seasoned like you all, like you all have been through the workforce. You've all been through college, but you've also all like had your own like struggles with, do I really want to do this? And that's what a lot of college, a lot of college students and a lot of high school students haven't been through yet. And we, we don't know, we don't know what's out there for us and what, our personal skills are best for. If I could add to like uh, mentorships are very different than say advisors. When, when students get into college, you have an advisor telling you, take this course, take this course, follow your degree plan. Next, right? But mentors, mentors, someone that you can sit down with and, and speaking from my personal um, experience, when I got into the PhD program, I think I had like 10 mentors. I just, anybody that went through the electrical engineering PhD program, you became my mentor. I needed, and I did, and they helped me focus and not get so caught up on my emotions because it's a hard program, not to get caught in that. So once you do this, Janie, focus on this, focus on that. And then when it came to my comp exams, this is where I say uh, the mentorship community is so important. It's nice to tell your family that you passed those exams, but when you can tell another doctor, doctorate that you passed those exams, they're like, they know what it means. They know what it took to pass those exams. So just relating to your mentor and just for them to be able to tell you now that you pass those exams, focus on this, focus on that, and you can kind of bounce things off of them. It's, it's very important and it kept me very on track, very on track. And I, I really appreciate it. Mentorship is so important. And I really wish that we could implement some type of mentorships earlier on for the undergraduate experience. I think that would really help with the retention and the matriculation rates. I think it would really help because again, they get lost. They get lost and they they can't make it. Never mind, like we talked about the hard or the complicated or complexity of the coursework. What about the support and just their young adults? Like she said, she's 21. I remember being 21 on a college campus and like, now we'll do what? <laughs> what is going to happen next? So yeah, if I had someone other than my father at that time on campus, that would have been great telling me, you're going to go do this, you're going to do this. Just ironing it out for me would have been wonderful. And that's kind of what I try to provide for my students. But if it was implemented within the institution, I think creating that space for that mentorship, it will go, it'll go over a lot better. You know what I mean? Because if faculty advisors don't really have, I don't want to say the time, but the time, right? To really do a mentorship if they're responsible for external research, they're responsible for all these other different things. And now you want me to talk to who? I don't have time to talk to, but if they put that space, they created that space at that level, I think that would, yeah, it would, it would do great for keeping some of these students that may be um, told in the line of, as far as wanting to stay in STEM or not, it would, it would do great. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. Well, we are 
at time. Carol, I will let you uh, have some final words. And uh, in the meantime, I'd like to say thank you to all of our panelists and all of our participants. Carol, I'll let you uh, take it away. You guys were fabulous. What a great way to spend the last hour. And I just hope we get to see everybody in person. And we will have a Nesby session here at Global Minded in June. So, so, so we'll be uh, making a lot of connections. And um, Jane and Jason and Quezzy, hope you all can join Paula and me and about 1,200 other just amazing, generous leaders across all different backgrounds um, in June. So thank you all so much for being tremendous African-American leaders and we honor you and um, everyone this month and every, I'll just say every minute of every day always, even when it's not February or not MLK day. And uh, we're just really great. Um, it's a great opportunity and a big blessing to do the work of just improving the world in a bigger way with inclusive leaders like each of you. So thanks for all your time and have a wonderful rest of this month. And we hope if it works out, you might join us to meet our health leaders um, next Monday at the same time or share with your students who might be interested in, in health or bio, biomedicine. So thanks everybody. And Paula, thanks for always bringing such a great group of people to our community. Thank you guys. Bye. Take good care. Bye. Bye. Thank you so, so good to